Welcome and thank you for joining me for the final talk, which is part of the lecture series Queer Voices in Art and Social Justice. I'm Alpesh Kantilal Patel, an Associate Professor of Contemporary Art and Theory and an affiliate faculty at both the Center for Women and Gender Studies and African and African Diaspora Studies at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. I want to begin by acknowledging that the territory now known as South Florida has been the traditional homeland of Native nations, including the Calusa, the Tequesta, and today the Miccosukee and the Seminole. Uh, the Queer Voices series has been supported by FIU Embus from Miami Beach Urban Studios, and programming at Embus is supported by the City of Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Cultural Development, Office of Cultural Affairs, and the Miami Beach Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Queer Voices in Art and Social Justice has also been supported by the Center for Women and Gender Studies and by the College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts, or CARTA. And I also want to thank CARTA's Diversity, Equity, Initiative Task Force and FIU Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. We've had so many wonderful people get together to make this happen, um, and I sincerely thank all of you for that. Uh, all right, so I'm going to introduce our, our lecturer today, DJ Rekha, Rekha Maholtra, is a, a DJ, producer, curator, and educator. They've been credited with pioneering Bhangra music in North America via Basement Bhangra Club Night, which ran from 1997 to 2017, so an impressive 20 years. Uh, Rekha was a sound designer for the Tony Award-winning Broadway show Bridge and Tunnel and was an associate producer for the NPR radio documentary, A Feet in Two Worlds. Rick has curated events for Celebrate Brooklyn, Central Park Summer Stage, and has performed at the o Obama White House and many places internationally. Uh, their weekly podcast is Bangra and Beyond, and they have a master's in comparative media studies from MIT. Uh, with that, Rekha, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh... Thank you everyone uh, for putting this together. Uh, Colette, uh, Yanara navigating the university bureaucracy. Um, I'm speaking to you from Jackson Heights, Queens, New York, uh, formerly of uh, land acknowledgement which to acknowledge the Lanape and Canarsie um, <clears throat> peoples. Uh, so I'm just gonna start uh, with my uh, presentation. Share screen. Okay. So, um, as per my introduction, I, I am a DJ, and I th think about not just the medium of the art, but what I do in terms of my art practice is to think of space as as resistance. So, just to give you a little bit of my background, um, my parents were born in. Uh, pre-partition uh, India, uh, pre-partition uh, Pakistan, uh, which, is, uh, which is now Pakistan. This is them. Uh, they were married in, in 67. They had a what we call a love marriage, which was um, its own form of resistance at the time. And it was easier for them to leave the country than it was to leave their joint family household, their multi-generational household. So I was born, this is my mom, this is me, uh, in London. So, um, and that's important later. And then we moved to uh, New York in the, um, in 76. This is the Flushing, New York, the Unisphere and a very deadly Ford Pinto. Uh, and then my family settled in Westbury, Long Island, um, which is a community 30 minutes outside of uh, New York City, but uh, it's suburban, but it's, predominantly African-American and uh, Caribbean-American. And all of this informed my, my upbringing and my art practice. Um, so I was born in London in the 70s and as I just said, uh, moved to, uh, lived in Queens uh, as an early kid, Long Island, then back to Brooklyn. And I went to Queens College, which is in Flushing, and started as an English major and eventually found my way to urban studies. Uh, but it was um, here where um, I think I got my first real dose of politicization. Politicization, I can never say that word. Um, in 1987, there was a rash of 
um, violent episodes in, in Jersey where there was this, uh, a growing community of South Asians. Um, can everyone see the slide, right? I can't tell because I can see myself. So, okay, so if, as long as it's full screen. And um, there were a rash of incidents. Uh, two famous ones were uh, a man was uh, beaten to death after being attacked with racial slurs while his colleague was left untouched exiting a bar, an Indian man, Nafroz Moody. And the second incident of the time uh, was um, a doctor beaten for dead in front of a fire station across uh, a park where a lot of uh, youth hung out. And in response to this violence, a letter was sent to the newspaper. And this was widely published not just in the newspaper, the Jersey Ledger, but it was also published in the Indian newspapers that my parents subscribed to. And I'm gonna read it to you because uh, it, it shook me then as a 16 year old and it still does now. I'm writing about your article during July about the abuse of Indian people. Well, I'm here to state the other side. I hate them. If you had to live near them, you would also. We are an organization called Dot Busters. We have been around for two years. We will go to any extreme to get Indians to move out of Jersey City. If I'm walking down the street, I see a Hindu and the setting is right, I will hit him or her. We plan some of our most extreme attacks, such as breaking windows, breaking car windows and crashing family parties. We use the phone book and look up the name Patel. Have you seen how many of them are, there are? Do you even live in Jersey City? Do you walk down Central Avenue and experience what it's like to be near them? We have, and we just don't want it anymore. You say that we'll have to start protect, you, you say, you said that they will have to start protecting themselves because the police cannot always be there. They will never do anything. They are weak race, physically, mentally. We're gonna continue our way. We will never be stopped. So this was uh, very disheartening. And the reason why the subtext in here is like, they will never do anything, is that a lot of, some of the folks involved in the violence were actually part of a deeper culture that we're now, I think, understanding more every day of being affiliated with, with the police of the time, Hudson County Police. So none of the criminal uh, charges stuck. And then several years later, when I was in college, there was a civil case and that's where I was asked to uh, pack the court with different organizations. And that sort of was uh, an introduction to me to a larger community of second generation South Asians that were working in different uh, social causes. And it helped me forge a community of uh, activists and artists, uh, eventually leading to uh, a community that was part of, and Alpesh would know, the South Asian Women's Creative Collective, which was mostly visual arts, but was uh, committed to uh, visibility of emerging South Asian uh, women artists. Um, um, the, uh, the other thing about at Queens College that I got heavily involved in was just organizing at that time around identity-based social groups. And in terms of, um, I think without knowing it, it was my first foray into challenging constructs of space many of um, the events there were, were often on the weekends and geared towards weekend partying where the reality of the lives of the students that were there were, they were constrained by family obligations and social norms. So we would do our events during the day to allow for greater participation. Um, but it's where I got my first do dose of event organizing. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the genre of music I'm most associated with, just to give you some context, which is Bhangra. So Bhangra, I mean, it's become a ubiquitous word, but it's originally a form of Punjabi folk music and dance that originates from Punjab, a region divided by India and Pakistan. So this kind of connects back to my parents who were born in what is now Pakistan and migrated to India when they were six and seven years old. That community of people eventually migrated, uh, large swaths of people migrated to the, to the UK in the 50s and 60s to fill labor source, uh, a labor shortage post-World War II. Uh, so if we look at the map here, um, you can see this whole region was not a nation state. Um, and this is where Punjab is. So this is a better look at Punjab. So Punjab is divided here. And the capital of Punjab in India is Amritsar. And in, 
Pakistan is Lahore, and these are, I think, less than uh, 10 miles apart. So um, culturally, this was a big, big rift. Um, and it's often misstated that Punjab is only in India because of the dominance of, of India as a, as a nation and an idea. So um, I started the party in 1997. And rather than me say it, this is a little um, a video clip that sort of encapsulates my my reason and and uh, just some live clips from the party that was done uh, when it was ending. So I'll just let you watch this. Bongo makes you happy, makes you want to dance. When you hear your song, when you hear your jam, when you drop your drink and you run to the dance floor and you just want to dance, it's it's just joyous. <laughs> For more than two decades, DJ Reka has been breaking boundaries and building a community that embraced the unconventional. In 1997, Reka Malhotra started Basement Bhangra, an underground party in New York that became a beloved space for young South Asians. In a world where white men are often arbiters of culture, not their own, I think it's powerful for, for those of us who are from our culture to be arbiters of our own culture, to create our own spaces and to get other people in it, but do it in our own terms. I think one of the, the, the beauties of our, our, about Base and Bhangra is it was definitely almost a place for misfits <laughs> in the sense that it fights against the ideas of what South Asian representation is. Some of us are queer and some of us dress differently. And it, you know, it was sort of an anti-model minority situation. <laughs> Bhangra is a type of folk music from the Punjab region of India and Pakistan and it's the ultimate dance party. DJ Reka mixed those sounds with hip hop, electronica, and dance hall, helping to introduce the music to US audiences. I grew up in, in Queens, New York, and Long Island, the suburb. I grew up around the beginnings of hip hop, and two degrees, because being in Long Island, we were near Queens, and somebody knew somebody who knew LL Cool J at all times. In the 90s, a critical mass of young South Asians raised in the U.S. were coming of age, and they were ready to get down. Reka quickly became one of the go-to DJs for that party scene. When I was getting hired to do these parties, a lot of these club promoters, they wanted to sort of police the crowd via the sound. So the way you do that is they would tell us, don't play hip-hop and don't play Punjabi music or Bhangra music, because Bhangra music within the community was seen as low-class music, cab driver music. It's too rowdy, it's too whatever, wild. We don't want those kinds of people. And hip hop is thugs, we don't want thugs. So the idea behind Bass and Bunga was really to, to create a space and a party that celebrated Bunga music, but had a New York sensibility because I grew up on hip hop as well. So sort of, those styles sort of lend themselves to each other with a, I would say, with a splash of dance hall. And we got a huge, a huge diverse audience. So it's often been noted like from Wall Street brokers to like, club kids to like drag queens. It's people and the common denominator really is the music and dancing. After 20 years, DJ Reka decided it was time to end the party and move on to new projects. The last basement Pungra was held in the same club where it started, full to the brim of the community that had been sustaining it since the 90s. Being in the space, holding space, creating space is political in and of itself. And I'm a, a female DJ. I'm a queer person who's a DJ, but I'm not any of those things preceding my name. Once you do that, you diminish what I do. I think, I hope the legacy is that it's possible to create art and a space that builds community, that you can do things with in your culture and control it. And I just think that people remember it for what it is and what it was. So, um, just to add to that, I mean, the impetus for the party was to create a space free from the policing, the creative policing of trying to, you know, nightlife is, is aspirational in so many ways. I mean, Miami, you should know, <laughs> is, is like a, an epicenter for nightlife. And there's a lot of policing on the door uh, in terms of charges, you know, what's expected, dress codes. And I wanted to create something that was free of that. and. Uh, at that time, there was a growing South Asian party scene, which I was a part of. And just, you know, I, I wanted to create a space. I guess 
I guess in terms of the queerness of the party is like to create a space for marginalized people. So within a sort of, even within a community, you can have marginalization of, you know, extremely binary, extremely heteronormative. And, you know, there were, hu it was a very homosocial space in that there were, you know, often groups of men, turban men dancing who, you know, probably couldn't relate to me outside of that context, but there was a place there where we connected. Um, and through the course of the night, um, uh, through the course of the party over several years, I, I, you know, as, as demanded, like there were different fundraisers and stuff. So I, I saw the party also as a way to, uh, you know, other ways of building community, raising voices and, and stuff. So I had a series within the party for a while, I'll uh, call your attention, please. Um, it became hard to manage after a while, but I uh, did raise a lot of money for different organizations. Um, and as different crises come, we did do fundraisers. So th these are some of the flyers. And most of these flyers were four by six and they were dispersed. This is before um, even like email before social media physically handed out a lot of flyers and I saw this as an opportunity as a canvas as a medium um, so it took a lot of care and concern uh, to to make the flyers uh, interesting and I think of all the flyers again this was a four by six piece um, but also because the artwork was so spectacular we did um, we did some larger prints of it um, uh, during the summer months, the party was first Thursday. During the summer months, um, we would uh, do a bonus night. And this was the year of the Republican National Convention in New York, 2004. And we did a bonus night. And a lot of the activists that were protesting the convention uh, would sort of come by as a gathering space. So we partnered with Not In, Not In Our Name, uh, which had a manifesto, which we printed on the back of the flyer. Um, and encouraging people to protest against uh, the forever wars. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, I think, and I collaborated with an artist called Pardon My Hindi who created this as inspired by early 20th century boxing posters. So it's, you know, Bhangra versus Bush and alliteration is always helpful. Uh, another moment was this, uh, this piece uh, in here is actually, um, was refashioned by, Chitra Ganesha, a friend and an artist, and we called this the end of the British Raj, sort of a take against colonialism where, especially in the diaspora, nation states, you know, Independence Day of nation states are very celebrated. Uh, Pakistani Independence Day is August 14th, Indian Independence Day is August 15th, but, you know, uh, I like tend to recast it and look at it as the end of the British Empire uh, exiting those places. Um, and um, at this time, I think this is 2001, both India and Pakistan became nuclear enabled. So it was sort of a tongue in cheek thing. And, and the flyer was also a place for humor and lightness. So like here we have free drinks that we're giving out and then we fashion, uh, you know, the umbrella on the drink uh, a certain way. And this is also another joke around Bush and, you know, I don't want to be late for Basin Bhangra. We might miss the free cake. Did you say free steak? You know, just kind of having fun at it. And um, wishing Obama a goodbye. Um, and the other thing we always did at the parties, so just to think of the party as the project of the party is, you know, the DJing, the music, the dance floor, the flyer, but also we always had visuals there. And it's in some ways a co-collaborative project of who's in the space, especially as a DJ, I'm responding to who's there in terms of what I'm playing and really informed by that. Um, so uh, one thing we uh, were very struck by as many New Yorkers were, was of course 9-11. Um, and we, the club, SOBs where the place was, was about a mile from ground zero. Um, 10 years after 9-11, uh, I was asked to do a reflection on what happened uh, that night. And I'll just read you, uh, this was printed in the Asian American Literary Journal, which is just sort of my reflection. 
of what happened that night. So uh, how do you throw a party when it feels like the world is falling apart? We were slated to do the last bonus night of the, of, of the year of my monthly event based in Bangor downtown venue on September 20th. In its fourth year, the monthly success of our sold out first Thursday show prompted the venue to double up the summer, adding third Thursdays as a bonus night. It was nine days after 9-11. What are we gonna do? The club's owner's wife pushed against opening, stating racial backlash concerns. Turban sick men were noticeable segment of our core audience. Her ignorance was irritating and somewhat surprising to me as she reflected the assumptions of many people believed that Muslim terrorists per per perpetrated the attacks and that six were Muslim. Even beloved, ordinarily savvy local NPR talk show host, Brian Lehrer thought Sikhism was a sect of Islam. The first direct case of violence in response to the attacks happened four days after 9-11, when Babir Singh Sodhi was gunned down in Arizona. Several such other such incidents happened months after. But that aside, we had to decide, do we open? Do we advertise, promote an event that relies on the good spirits in a room full of people who want to dance so close in time and space that to all that had just happened? Would going forward with the night be in poor taste or disrespectful to those who had so who had lost so much, even though we had little or no expectation who would come or what we what people would think? We decided we had to open to provide space for people to gather. The question, the questions that were so hard to figure out in the days after 9-11 are some we still face. After Katrina, after the Pakistan earthquake, after the tsunami, after the Mumbai blasts, do we, do we keep doing what we do? The answer has always been yes. You do open because sometimes a party is not just a party, it's also a community space. Um, so uh, talk is cheap, so let me, I'm gonna play a little bit of music. One of the things that came out of the party is I produced a CD full length CD and this is the title track. I'll just play you a little bit of it. Okay, cursor, there we go. That's the title track. It was a 16, uh, 17 track mix CD. And um, some of the, the lyrics are sung. I mean, obviously the intro is by Wyclef Sean. And, you know, at that time I was sort of responding to prior to that a few years, there were a lot of Indian sounds and hip hop samples. And I just wanted to say, and I told Clef, Wyclef, I was like, you know, there's a lot of talk around all of all, uh, hip hop as appropriation and, and, you know, which is ironic because DJing as a, as an enterprise is appropriation in itself. So it's a complicated thing to say, but I said, you know, uh, you know, just referencing like, where did the Indian sounds come from? That was just sort of the nod to that, to do your research. And then the final project of the party um, was, um, the final event of the party was um, a, a show at Central Park Summer Stage. And upon reflecting um, that day and thinking about what was programmed, um, you know, I don't know as I started the party uh, that I had the language or, the, I, or the, the thinking behind what queerness was or how it fit in any way. I, I think, um, 
none of n this party was not explicitly queer in its in its way, but it was queer in so many other ways. And then different artists. Um, and I'll just. Uh... <laughs> Brown hip hop, brown music in America without bringing up New York City. How y'all feel? She became like a, a big queer sister to me. That's important because, like, I'm queer and she made a lane for me. And so, because of her, I could do what I do and have a space to do it. This is a nice bow on a package to humanity. I'm not gonna miss her. She's in my life forever. <laughs> She's been doing it this year. I'd like to ask all artists on stage to join me. So, um, you know, that was probably one of the best days of my life. And it was in 2017. So if you think about it, it's, it's um, three years before... Um, the uprisings of this year and I think I knew that there would probably be a lot of people and um, what was I gonna say and you know what is the opportunity here and of course as an artist you're always thinking what are you gonna wear <laughs> so I I thought it was important for me to wear a Black Lives Matter shirt um, because my body was a piece of canvas and I thought like you know it was important to say it then as it as it has been since since um since unfortunately that phrase has been generated and um so that was very important to me so just to talk about um just how I mean uh the party lives on there was uh there's an archive of some of the stories if anybody wants to check out on SoundCloud South Asian Digital Archives um uh took a bunch of interviews and just some reflections of the party. And this is a friend of mine, Dilo, who's a trans performance artist and just happened to be there in town that day that this event happened. So another party uh, I started with a collective of people was Mutiny and this sort of ran parallel in, uh, alongside Basement. And this party, again, within, within different, the genres of music that were available, this was, even another subset of music that was coming out of, inspired by music that was coming out of the UK, second and third generation South Asians that were using South Asian sounds, but outside of Bhangra, which is still a sort of a dominant style of music within certain diaspora communities. And um, this was more of a collective and it was more electronic based. Uh, again, this is the artwork is done by the same artist who did the other flyer for the Bhangra against Bush. And you know the 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 bulk of this time in New York is the '90s, the mid '90s, and the aughts. And um, simultaneous to these events, were there was a huge South Asian queer scene, a uh, queer scene at large. It's New York City, so I was also a participant in those events with Salga South Asian Lesbian and Gay Association that did an annual fundraiser um, for the Audrey Lord Project, um, and inspired by the vibe. At those parties where there was a lot of Bollywood music played, I try to create a, what I was trying to envision as a queer straight space. Um, and uh, I'll just go. And then frustrated with that idea, I created something else. So these are some of the flyers from that time, Stardust. And these have become a very important artifacts of our history, queer history in New York. Um, uh, so uh, 
Uh, and in 2007, <clears throat> uh, a, a lesbian nightclub opened in Brooklyn and the, I don't even think one exists today, Caddyshack, and the owner asked me to think of a, of a, of a, of a party. And even though there were queer South Asian parties, those parties also felt very um, male dominated and they didn't always feel like safe space for queer women. In fact, they seemed like safer spaces for straight women who were interested in being in different, in, in non-heteronormative spaces. So this party was specifically designed hope, uh, for queer South Asian women and non-binary folks. And, you know, it, it was challenging because we had to deal with, um, you know, some of the dynamics, the racial dynamics that exist in different places were apparent here. Um, we weren't always welcome there. And uh, we were taking over the normal night of the club. Some of the regular patrons would get annoyed. What's this music? It's the kind of stuff you're always battling in nightclubs. Um, this is Bollywood Disco was the other project which was more driven on Bollywood music. Uh, some of the artwork. Uh, and um, how am I doing on time? Should I, I think that that's that's it. I will stop right here. If anybody has questions, uh, actually no, I'll I'll show you one more thing, which is the last project I worked on. Just to deeper reflect, was at MIT. I did a um, a sort of an assessment as I was, you know, I'm a DJ nerd, and um, uh, my thesis project was. Uh, uh, looking at um, DJing, uh, sort of um, challenging the 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 myth of uh, DJing as a, a very male dominated practice, because no matter what we say about how diverse it is in terms of gender, um, all the literature, all the education, all the folklore around DJing is still very male dominated. So I did a, a bunch of field work and interviews to sort of uh, you know, challenge that idea. So that's it. That's it. You don't have anything more. <laughs> you, I don't know. <laughs> like, am I? Oh, no, I'm saying this amazing what you presented. So much to kind of discuss and and think about. And again, I just want to encourage people to put your questions in the in the chat, and uh, and then I can ask Rekha about that. And while while you're doing that, uh, I wanted to kind of ask you about something you said in your talk, which I thought was really important about, um, you know, you were talking in the video, you were discussing dance and, and uh, um, the adjectives of uh, queer or South Asian that get before it are, are, some, are really not important. It's the dance that, that is, uh, that's crucial. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that. Like, I think, I think as an artist, you know, you're, I mean, I'm so deeply informed and it's seeped into my histories and where I'm from. It's like, you know, I, I took on, I fell in love with an extremely male dominated form that is very bro-y and, you know, I don't even didn't have the words and to know that I was gay or queer at the time. And I'm like, hmm, what's that about? But I think as an artist, you want to be an artist. You don't want to be a, like, it's that thing of you don't want things to, to precede your description of your art to limit you. And even though based on Bhangra, which was like the most of this presentation is, is, is probably, you know, it's a very significant part of my art career. It's not the only thing. And, and just to feel not limited or constrained by it. And I don't shy away from being identified, you know, in that way. But I think, I think, you know, the identity is a slippery slope. You know, it's like used in convenience, it's empowering, but limiting, you know. And, and you know, I should just tell everyone that um, I was in New York City from like in 97 to 2005. So I had an opportunity to be part of some of these spaces that Rekha produced. I'm so thankful that she produced these spaces that were, that were, um, very welcoming and uh, you put together sounds and beats that felt um, so natural and yet we don't hear that, right? Like these different voices coming together. You can see the pastiche of the, uh, the different uh, elements that are coming together so, so beautifully um, through that.
for your DJing. Thank you. Yeah, and the, the, the posters that you brought, the flyers, mm -hmm. I thought that was a really interesting thing. I mean, I just forgot about that in a way, like, right? <laughs> social media, I, mean, online, don't... I don't know, like, we, <laughs> we don't even think about it, but, but all the time and care that went into those. And uh, there was, the flyers took up so much of my time because first of all, just the production of them, like we didn't, I mean, you needed somebody who had Photoshop. You had to, the, the mechanics of getting a flyer printed, you had to get a designer. I mean, the venue had somebody in-house. You had to get it, sometimes you had to get a, a negative made, then you had to get it physically printed. Um, you had to sometimes carry around a zip disk. I mean, you couldn't email files, you know? And just conceptually, like, and you had a lot, have a lot more lead time. Like, I mean, now the rate of things and I can go into Canva or whatever, some thing and like spit out a flyer in 30 seconds, you know, or whatever. And I think the flyers to me were really, I looked at them as art and I was very, very, very like thoughtful about them or wanted to make sure that they were also not racist <laughs> or weird. The first flyer the club did um, was really like a Hindu god up, turned upside down and this and that. And I was always looking for, to interject humor, um, some sort of pop culture, uh, something familiar maybe like, you know, often, you know, just ripping off an Indian product and repackaging it. Um, and then, you know, when, when relevant, trying to push it in terms of geopolitical ideas or other things, you know. Yeah, I mean, we used to physically hand, I mean, I just think average party, you'd print 5,000 flyers. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you'd have to go get rid of them somehow. And sometimes we'd mail, physically mail them out. That's a lot. It's like, labels, stamps, <laughs> all of it. Um, and there's a lot of invisible labor and some of that, that work came out in the conversations I had for my thesis is the amount of invisible labor there is in DJing and party production and just what we don't see. It's like, you know, of course it's like this, like we're going to have a good time, but what's going on behind the scenes? What are the dynamics that are happening there? Okay, if I a, a comment and question from John Stewart. Uh, wonderful program, thank you. Any further reflections on the body as a canvas comment? That seems very interesting in terms of the intersection of visual art and performance space. Um, I think, I don't really see, I really, I, I think I was very aware that day that I would be very visible and my own dealings with my comfort and discomfort of my body, <laughs> I had to sort of figure it out. I just felt like it was an opportunity to say something and that's where I was. I don't think I've often uh, done that. I kind of just wear a t-shirt with whatever on it. Um, so um, it's not something I, I routinely employ or, or have in practice, you know. But in terms of like images and, and visuals that are connected to the party, I'm very picky about, you know, uh, there was a time when I was touring and doing these really weird like jam band type gigs and not Burning Man, but Burning Man adjacent. And I had to really intercede like, and be like, it was actually a, in my contract, like nothing I find offensive. And that's a very like weird thing to say, what is offensive, it's subjective, but you know, wherever you have control, like exert it. So, um, yeah. I have another comment um, uh, to discuss the influence of MIT on your <laughs> <laughs> Is that something you've re recently done? Your yeah, I did that after I finished the party, I went to, I mean, I went to, I went, I did a, a two year master's program. The influence of MIT? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, it was like where I was a humanities student in a very STEMI school in a program that people barely knew existed. So in next to the media lab, but not the media lab. So, which ended up having a huge scandal. Um, 
I think for me personally, this is not art. It was the first time I left New York. So that was a whole other experience. And it was sort of like um, after grinding for 20 years, throwing a party at like 46, I'm like, let me go to grad school. Why not? Let me take a break. Um, it wasn't really a break, but it was it was an opportunity to explore deeper some of some of these things that I was thinking about. And I love media. And I, in the course of my career, I had been teaching. I taught at Tisch for a little bit and I just, you know, wanted to sort of go deeper. And it was I got into this program. It was a great opportunity. You've been very fluid with how you how you operate. You tell this fine line between maybe let's say fine art and the elitism of, of, of what that um, uh, connotes uh, and, uh, and the popular and also the academic. You were a, a fellow at the Asia Pacific American Institute at NYU mm -hmm. as well. So it's um, an interesting kind of confl um, confluence of uh, that, that you embody, uh, which is quite fascinating. Um, Thank There's you. a comment here from uh, Dimitri. Uh, is it still as male dominated a space as ever or less so than 24 years ago? Well, the party doesn't exist. <laughs> so um, I think things are, I, I can't say. Um, I think, um, I think in some ways, nightlife in New York is very gender regulated and we did not, enforce those genders that those kinds of rules like a lot of places do ladies free and things like that which I never uh, endorsed so I think in some ways especially um, um, uh, given the fact that um, especially post 9-11 like turban men were targets that this was in some ways a weird safe space for men <laughs> not always good uh, for other people. And I, I'm not saying it was always a completely safe space or a safe space for queer people at large, but um, people are always fighting gender dynamics. Like every club promoters, even in, you know, there's always a desire to have less cis men in the club. <laughs> that's just, that's, those are goals, those are club goals. That's just, that's just you know, um, the energy and the vibe is different when that happens, you know. Um, you know, just in relation to that, the uh, the recent anti-Asian violence from a very different group of Asian Americans that's that's come up um, that came up in our conversation before. Just uh, you know, how as a cultural producer do you respond to that? And I really enjoyed how you dis described you know the the difficulty of figuring out what to do around these kinds of events uh, and that in the end it was really just about to continue to um, have a space to create these spaces. Yeah I mean and and that that challenge has come up many times um, many times that um, I mean it's it's even in the pandemic um, so my response in the pandemic has been I, I was live streaming for a while and I was using the sessions to raise money for different organizations, especially during the uprisings, specifically. Um, and, um, you know, I just think that's, I don't know, what, what else can you do? You have to keep going. And I think, you know, that night, not September 20th, 2001, we got 30 people. Um, I don't even think we charged. And um, it's just like, we needed some place to be. I mean, we, I just remember it so vividly, you know, a lot of TV, a lot of fear. And then it's a very different message than going through this pandemic, which was, um, there was this like public notion of like defiance of like, kind of this like don't let the terrorist win like gather you know be out resist in that way and um here it's like stay home you know they're not the same things i don't want to draw like unequal parallels but um you know people things are you know things happen that devastate like culture industries you know nightlife gets devastated that week of 9 11 was 
a week in New York that's very popping, CMJ, Fashion Week. There's all these things that happen. It's sort of like a fall reset. It's the week after Labor Day. And that's when things start. There's an energy and a shift that happens in New York. Um, and that was disrupted um, in a deep way. And, um, and then we just couldn't, even when I wrote that, I'm like, you know, even when, when those things were happening, we just could not have imagined or maybe we were naive not to understand the impact of special registration, the impact on South Asian Muslim communities, you know, the state sponsored like surveillance of Muslim communities in New York, um, all, all of those things that were to come, you know, we, we couldn't have seen it. Uh, we, we, I mean, maybe some people did. We always knew our phones were tapped, but, um, and then we were proven correct. So, um, yeah, it was really, it was a real, I, I think in some ways the party after 9-11 was a very important space. It, be, it gained, it was more important for people to, to gather in that way, you know. Yeah, and I can say personally for me, um, uh, I went to one of those spaces. I don't know if it was one of your parties, but it was um, uh, a space of brown people. So it was <laughs> a sense of, you know, being able to be visible um, but to be safe in, in numbers in some way. You're, you know, the, uh, the letter that you read still chills me from the very beginning, the one in, from the 1980s, because it just feels like it, it's something that could have been um, sent yesterday, right? Or, or, or today. Well, yeah, I mean, this rise in anti-Asian violence is, is so upsetting, but like, I grew up with this. I mean, in Flushing, Queens, which is where some, a lot of these attacks are happening, um, you know, we didn't go to school on Halloween because we'd get egged. Like, you know, Asian and Indian kids. And there was still a lot of bullying. Um, and that was just sort of a way of life. Like, you just knew that. That was just what, what it was. Um, so, um, you know, the recent events have stoked this fire, but the invisibility of Asian American stories and our, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's too bad. <laughs> and um, just the framework of Asian American organizing and just, you know, it's whatever. There's, there's a deeper history that's just not known, you know. This is why it was so great that you brought it up. Just that, that history um, needs to continue to be documented and aware that it's, what's ever happening now is not something um, unfortunately new. And, you know, and I think white supremacy is divide and conquer, you know, it, it creates strife within communities of color within, you know, and um, yeah, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> um, you know, I had another question. This is a connection to uh, an incubator space that we have at FIU. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm probably going to get some of the small details, but it was essentially a, a space that was created to, to bring in artists to uh, maybe reposition the kind of creative work they do um, in an entrepreneurial fashion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, this, this is what you do, actually. Like, I feel like that you, you're an artist, um, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're, um, you're making money, right? Like, at, as well, like, you know, the, the idea of the starving artist, which still um, it seems to be with us. Like, you have to, if, to be an artist, you have to starve, or you can't be making money, or it needs to be hidden if you are. Uh, in some way, but this is something you've navigated quite um, well. And I was just curious if you could speak to that very unusual position of, of being- Well, yeah. I, I think that, you know, growing up in an immigrant business family, I kind of view the business as art and the art as business, but it didn't always mean I was successful at it. In some ways I was, in some ways I wasn't. Like, you know, um, talk to the IRS. <laughs> They're not that happy with me right now. Um, <laughs> Andy Warhol, uh, right? He said that too, right? Art is just yeah. a business is art. Andy Warhol, I think he said something like uh, that. Yeah, whatever. I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman. Jay-Z said it too, you know? <laughs> um, so I think, um, you know, we, we, we operate in capitalism. So we have to figure out how we are going to negotiate that. And the way to disrupt capitalism or to challenge it is to um, you know, for my parties, I made sure they were accessible. And I made sure that if you didn't have money, like, 
it was still, there was still a way to get in for five bucks until the end. And to me, that's one small contribution or to make sure that you pay every single person that's working or performing or do all those things. Um, I, I did not, I mean, I just kind of, all of this happened organically. There was not a master plan. So it happened one by one and I struggled a lot. I was in school when I started, I was had several day jobs. It was, there was a lot of like, I didn't know how to manage money at all. And that was a struggle because even though I came from a business family, my father wasn't very supportive or generous or imparting any of his knowledge, partly because I don't know his tactics of managing his businesses. Maybe that was for the better, I don't know. So, and I, it was all self-made. So while there are other artists, they have different infrastructures and different familial wealth. And, and you know, I did end up at a fancy school in the end, but not before that. So like, it's all learning on the, learning, you know, on the road, learning at the job, all of it. And we're getting close to being out of time. And I'm wondering if, if anyone has any other questions, uh, please do put that in the chat. Um, you know, I think just uh, as we're waiting, if someone does, or just to fill this, this the rest of the time, I'm really curious also about the dance floor as space that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it is so um, democratizing in some way, or it, 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 it's the queer space in the largest sense, right? It's, it's, it's space for everybody, everyone you can say. Um, and you spoke a little bit about that um, in your presentation, just the, the idea of spaces being created and uh, um, what they can generate. I'm wondering if you could just- Yeah, I mean, the dance floor is interesting. I mean, when it was busy, it was packed and they were often circle of dancers and men. And in some ways that space could be not safe, but also very safe, you know, because um, there's sort of a, a teaching like, you know, there's like a cultural exchange there. Like, how do you dance of like fresh meat? Like, oh, let me show you how to do it. Let me flex, you know? Um, and sometimes, you know, in a nightclub where there's alcohol, you know, people are, it's not always safe, you know? And I don't think, I think that's something that I don't think I, you know, and there were, you know, and too many dudes in a room with too much alcohol, sometimes they, bump heads, you know, and, uh, but um, the vibe of the place, like we switched venues uh, in year 15 and it was a quote, better venue, better repute, better gear, like a lot more people working from a production point of view, nothing was broken, but the vibe of the place was so off. Like people didn't like going there. They didn't feel comfortable. Um, whereas SOBs had a different energy. It's, it's hard to explain, you know. Um, yeah, the dance floor is an interesting space. And then as a DJ, I'm always being informed by the dance floor because I never plan my sets. I just play, I have an idea and I know the context, but I have to constantly look at what's happening to know where to go. All right, this is a, actually a great question to end on uh, from Dimitri. What excites you most about mus the music scene now? Oh, uh, I think the idea of actually DJing again in front of people is exciting. I don't know when that will be. Like I've been live streaming and it's very weird. <laughs> it's weird. It's just weird. I'm gonna say it. Yeah, um, and I think there's, there's actually more to talk about um, with that particular point you made, but we, we are out of time now and I wanna be mindful of, of your time. I'm so thank thrilled you. that you were able to do this. Um, uh, and- well, uh, Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. I really- You're very it. welcome. Um, it, uh, as always, has been very illuminating um, hearing from you. And I'm glad this gave us a chance to reconnect actually on a personal note. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. As well. Well, look you up. I'm definitely, when I can, I'm going to get back to Miami. I'm cheesy. I love South Beach. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Can't help it. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you everyone for being here.